Um, I'd like to thank Kate Fowl for inviting me for my first ever trip to Moscow, um, which is somewhere I've been dreaming of visiting since I was a young communist when I was 14 years old and studying Russian at school in England. And I want to thank Brittany Stewart as well, although she has scarlet fever and I feel very sorry for her because she's been a great help. And also um, Snezhana Krasteva for all of her help in bringing me here and also to Masha and, and thank you for coming. It is Friday the 13th. Real life, Friday the 13th. The aim of this talk is very simple. To lay out my position on ethics as clearly as possible, to link it to questions of aesthetics and art practice, and then, if there's time, to connect that to politics and to what I hope is a certain vision of political resistance. So ethics, politics, ethics, aesthetics, and politics. The argument in a nutshell is that all compelling conceptions of ethics have to derive from two simple concepts, which I shall explain. The concepts of approval and demand. In other words, ethics requires a performance at the level of our subjectivity. Indeed, this performance shapes that subjectivity. Or, in other words, the ethical formation of subjectivity is performance. Any ethics that is worthy of the name has to be ethics in action, to quote the title of this conference. Ethics is the action, the praxis, of bringing a subject into being. And between ethics and politics stands aesthetics. And in particular, an idea of ethical, of aesthetic performance. Um, I have a whole text, but I'm gonna see whether I can just wing it. Can I hold this, is it okay? Is that, if I go like this, is this okay? Okay. Um, here is a diagram. <laughs> On this diagram, you find a picture of how I see um, philosophy. Uh, by philosophy, I mean everything. So by philosophy, I don't mean what is done in philosophy departments, but by philosophy, I mean a conceptual account of what there is. Right? Um, where does philosophy begin? Uh, one account of philosophy that you can find in ancient philosophy, in Aristotle, um, is that philosophy begins in wonder, in what the Greeks called thamatzein. My view is that philosophy, modern philosophy, begins not in wonder, but in an experience of disappointment. So the first claim is that philosophy begins in disappointment. And there are many forms of disappointment, uh, as I'm sure you are aware. Uh, the two forms of disappointment that interest me today are religious and political disappointment. And the two are linked. Let me talk about religious disappointment first. What is religious disappointment? It's very simple. Religious disappointment is disappointment with regard to the question of faith in God. Right? One can say that modern philosophy begins with an idea that uh, faith in God has broken down. The possibility of such faith has broken down. And with that breaking down of the question of religion, the question that opens is the question of meaning. 
This is very simple. If God was that being that provided a meaning to life, namely the meaning of life was bound up in relationship to a deity who provided the basis of meaning, once, that, once you declare that God is dead with Nietzsche, then what is the question, what is the meaning of life? The question that's raised is the question of the meaning of life. The problem that that opens, the question of meaning opens, is a very Russian problem. It is the problem of nihilism. It's the problem of what Nietzsche used to call, in, in French, he read the great Russian authors Turgenev and Dostoevsky in French, Nietzsche, nihilism à la Petersburg. Right? Nihilism à la St. Petersburg, or Russian nihilism. Um, so, the problem of nihilism is very simple. It is that the, the basis of meaning has evaporated. Or, another formulation that Nietzsche uses, is that the highest values have devalued themselves. The highest values have devalued themselves. God is dead. We have killed him, Nietzsche says. The declaration of meaninglessness that follows the death of God is what Nietzsche sees as nihilism. And for Nietzsche, and this is what I think is, is important, so I'm mentioning Nietzsche, um, the problem that philosophy has to face and thinking has to face and art has to face is how might one respond to nihilism? How might one resist nihilism? What would that look like? And at that point, I want to go over to this side of the, the diagram. And I'll come to these, these characters in a second. So, uh, the death of God leads to the question of meaning and opens the problem of nihilism. That's the thought so far. The other side of the, the schema is that the other form of disappointment is political disappointment. And what does that mean? Political disappointment is the um, experience of injustice. That we do not live in a world which is just, which is fair, which is moral. Rather, we live in a world which is profoundly unjust and unfair. A world where, as Dostoevsky says in Notes from Underground, blood is being spilt in the merriest way, as if it were champagne. Dostoevsky says, as if it were champagne. Now, such an experience of disappointment, political disappointment, is acutely tangible at the present moment. With the breakdown of established political structures, the ever enlarging fact of social inequality, the experience in particular in many Western European countries of an increasing turns towards xenophobia, towards forms of political reactionism, uh, where the political enemy is the asylum seeker, the immigrant, the outsider. So we live in a time of overwhelming political disappointment. The question that political disappointment raises is the question of justice. What might justice be in a world of political disappointment? And that then raises the need for an ethics. And that's the way the structure is going to work here. So that political disappointment raises the question of justice and gives rise to the need for ethics. So um, 
And what I'll try and lay out further on in the talk is the nature of ethics in particular, which links to two concepts I want to present, the concept of ethical experience and the concept of ethical subjectivity. Okay. Going back to the other side of the diagram, the problem of nihilism can be said to lead to two other responses that I want to call passive nihilism and active nihilism. What are they? In relationship to a world that appears to be meaningless, the passive nihilist simply withdraws takes him or herself off to a corner and contemplates, does a yoga class, thinks about their inner child, their psychological traumas, whatever. Fuck the world, I'm going to kind of withdraw from it. Right? So the passive nihilist looks at the chaos and disorder of the world and makes themselves into a little island of peace and contemplation. There is an awful lot of passive nihilism in the world. It's what Nietzsche called European Buddhism. And there's a lot of American Buddhism around. I don't know about Russian Buddhism, but it's certainly an option. So one option in the face of the present is to withdraw, to focus on ourselves, to take painkillers, do yoga, take lots of anti-anxiety medication, manipulate pyramids, write pessimistic sounding literary essays. You get this kind of picture. Now, the other option is active nihilism. Active nihilism is the view that the world is indeed meaningless, so let us destroy it. Let us tear it down. Right? Active nihilism is a, uh, a picture that once again you can find in Nietzsche and which he, it's another Russian moment, he identifies with, the, with Russian anarchism. Rus the, the fear of Russian anarchism which swept through Europe in the late 19th century. And that active nihilism swept through into, uh, developed into different groups uh, for example, into the Promethean activism of Lenin's Bolshevism, Marinetti's Futurism, Maoism, De Boer's Situationism, and different kinds of terrorist groups. And we could develop that. So, so in response to the question of nihilism, one option is to withdraw. I'll make myself into an island. I will keep myself peaceful in relationship to a world that is chaotic. The active nihilist says, no, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to bring that world crumbling down. I want to refuse both passive and active nihilism. So what does one do? I think we have to begin by thinking out of the situation in which we find ourselves. And what is the situation in which we find ourselves? We find ourselves in a situation of massive political disappointment. In a situation where the institutions and practices of Western liberal democracy appear strangely demotivating. So the situation that we find ourselves in, I would contend, is a situation of huge motivational deficit. Motivational deficit. If you want an example of that, that can be found, for example, in the numbers of people who are members of political parties in, say, the Western European democracies, with which I'm most familiar. Or you can find that, for example, in... Um, 
uh, in voting numbers in elections. Why vote? Why engage? These people are criminals. These people are corrupt. Why engage with the political process? So the situation in which we find ourselves, and I could say a lot more about that, is a situation that is radically demotivated. Right? That's the thought. So this motivational deficit is also a moral deficit, an ethical deficit. We do not believe anymore, if we did, but we do not believe anymore in the moral integrity of the institutions of the societies in which we believe, in which we live. We believe rather those institutions are are corrupt, are failing, and do not represent us. So the motivational deficit is an ethical deficit. I would argue that's part of the situation we find ourselves in. So what's required then is a conception of ethics that begins by accepting the motivational deficit in the institutions of liberal democracy without embracing either active or passive nihilism. What we require, in my view, is a motivating conception of ethics. A motivating conception of ethics. A notion of ethics which empowers subjects to act. That's what is required. But saying that is, in a sense, like verbal flatulence. What does that mean? In order to understand what that means, we have to understand something about the nature of morality. So having a conference on ethics is very nice, and I, I applaud you for it. But what is ethics? And what is the basic question of ethics? The basic question of ethics is, in my view, the following. How does a self bind itself to whatever it determines as its good? How does a self bind itself to whatever it determines as its good? And this is the idea that I call ethical experience. Let's see if this works. No. Ethical experience. It's very simple. Two concepts, approval and demand. The claim is that at the core of any ethics, if you like, the existential matrix of ethics is to give an account of what motivates a subject to act. Let me explain how this works. And the, the two concepts are approval and demand. The thought is that every conception of ethics is organized around some idea of a demand. And that demand is something I approve, and I bind myself to that demand and make myself into an ethical subject. It's a very simple thought. But let me give you some examples. If you were a Platonist, are there any Platonists in the audience tonight? Let's imagine there are. If you were a Platonist, then the demand will be the demand that's placed by the good, what, what Plato calls the good. And it's the good in relationship to which the soul has to approve in order to become a moral self in order to become what Plato would call a philosopher. If you are a Christian, let's imagine there are Christians in the audience tonight. <laughs> the demand would be the demand made by God. Right? And the, the, the shape that God can take is different. God in the form of Christ, God in the form of the revelation of uh, the prophet Muhammad, God in the form of the Mosaic law in Judaism, 
But each of those is an idea of a demand, and that demand is what I approve of in order to become uh, a subject. The, the simplest example would be someone like St. Paul. St. Paul, who was a, a Roman citizen, didn't really, was under, a citizen under the Roman Empire and a Jew, experiences the demand of, experiences the, the road to Damascus experience of the vision of the resurrected Christ. That vision of the resurrected Christ is a demand which he approves of and he changes himself from Saul to Paul. He becomes a Christian subject. And then his work, his political work, is how to transform other people into Christian subjects. And that's the formation of the churches. Okay? He writes letters, so, and so on and so forth. In what we call modernity, I mean, it's far too easy. I'm not much of a believer in modernity. But the demand would be the demand of, let's say, the moral law. If you're a Kantian, there are such creatures in the universe, Kantians. The demand would be the demand of the moral law. And the moral law is that in relation is the demand in relationship to which I become a moral subject. The difference between the Platonic and Christian accounts and the Kantian account is that the moral law does not reside in some God outside the self. The moral law is the law that I give to myself. It corresponds to the founding principle of modern ethics, which is autonomy. The only law to which I can be legitimately subject is the law I give myself, autonomy. And I could go on like this uh, with examples, but every, it's a very simple theory, but every conception of ethics, utilitarian, virtue ethics, deontological ethics, the various theories that one has, can each of which can be reduced to something like a concept of demand and a concept of approval. For me, the key um, experience in ethics is not a relationship to principles or uh, laws, but is an experience of subjectivity. And so linked to this structure of ethical experience is an idea of ethical subjectivity. Ethical subjectivity is the way in which a self relates itself to whatever it determines as good. Right? Now the good here is entirely empty. If you are a Kantian, the good is the moral law. Right? But if you are a sadist, if you are a follower of the Marquis de Sade, the good is that you should not give way on what the Marquis de Sade called in his late work, le droit de jouir, the right to orgasm. Right? So you can be a bad sadist as much as a bad Kantian. They both have conceptions, they're both organized around conceptions of the good. That's the point. This would be, um, I won't go into the philosophical terminology, it'd be meta-ethics, but let's forget that. So at the core of ethics is an idea of ethical subjectivity. Now, at which point I could then begin to unpack, it would take me about, an hour or something, and I won't do that this morning, my particular conception of ethical subjectivity. And I could recommend it to you as a certain version of what it means to be ethical. And you could say yes or no. And that reveals something essential about the nature of ethical argumentation, which I think is an important point to remember. Ethics is not logic, and it is not science. It is not logic insofar as the, the truth of moral propositions is not like logical truth, which is true by virtue of its inferences. And it's true, it's not true in the way in which scientific truth is true, which is by virtue of its, um, uh, its er experimental truth. Whether you can find truths in experience that fulfill the hypotheses. Moral truth is a different kind of thing. Um, in, in moral 
arguments, one makes recommendations, and those recommendations can be followed or not followed. It's up to you, and anything else would be a contravention of basic human freedom. Now, my picture of what it means to be an ethical subject is the following. How much time do I have now, roughly? Three, 30 minutes? Great. Um, my idea of, a, of a, an ethical subject is organized around three concepts. Um, the first concept is a concept of commitment. I would like to place the concept of commitment back at the heart of ethics and to do that against what I see as the, the great sickness of our time, which is the sickness of irony and the irony which leads to cynicism. And this is particularly the case in relationship to the art world, which in many ways is the homeland of irony. Right? And in many ways, for me to, to engage in a moral argument is to give up the privilege of irony, the privilege that you can slip away behind whatever performance you're doing and say, well, I don't really mean it, it's all bullshit, you know, I'm just doing it for money, or you know, I don't really, whatever. This is kind of, I think, intellectually dishonest. So the first concept I want to place at the heart of ethics is an idea of commitment, or what uh, Sartre called engagement, engagement. The second concept is an idea that there is an ethical demand, but the ethical demand is by definition an unfulfillable demand. Right? So the ethical demand is not a demand that I am equal to, but a demand which I can never fulfill, that I can never satisfy. The demand is something which is what I call in my jargon is infinitely demanding, infinitely demanding. And this, if you want, you know, I, I, this is coming to the sort of the third part of the, the thought, and maybe I should bring this up now, this will make it more, more, more practical, more real. If you want an example of uh, an infinitely demanding ethics, then you can think about ethics as it manifests itself in various resistance movements or in protest movements. For example, and I use the example just because it's a local example because I live in New York. But the example of Occupy Wall Street is interesting because the demands that were made, um, we are the 99%, uh, the demand that banks got bailed out, we got sold out, the, the demands are not finite demands, they're not pragmatic demands, they are infinite demands. And infinite demands made against uh, someone in power in order to, uh, in relationship to a situation of injustice, in order to bring about a certain uh, conception of change. So an infinitely demanding ethics based on commitment, and those infinite demands are not fulfillable. The third concept is an idea of what I call the individual. Individual, not individual, but individual. At the core of ethics is not an individual, but a individual, someone who is divided over against themselves in relationship to the ethical demand. So the ethical demand is not one that I can meet, it's, it's one whose force divides me from myself. And that experience of being divided against oneself, I think, is the experience of conscience. Right? Conscience isn't, shouldn't be good conscience. You know, I've done enough, I've given money to the poor, I've uh, supported this or that movement, but should be a certain productive bad conscience in relationship to a demand which I cannot meet. So... Those are the sort of three concepts I want to place in front of you. Um, and furthermore, 
So to give a, a practical example of this, th this idea of ethics is ethics is, an, is based, on the, uh, based on our infinite responsibility to the other person. Our infinite responsibility to the other person. Our responsibilities to the other person are never complete. We can never be satisfied or complacent. There is always more to be done. And furthermore, what's, what's crucial to this idea of ethics is that ethics is not first and foremost a, uh, a rational relation, it's not a relationship of reason, but it's first and foremost an affective relation, an emotional relation. So ethics is the experience of a demand, but a demand that evokes a certain emotional response. The, respon the experience of there being a moral wrong. Right? So when something is morally wrong, it's not that we feel that rationally it is morally wrong, but emotionally it's morally wrong. And we're outraged, and we want something to be done about it. So that's the kind of the way in which ethics gets structured for me. Okay. Um, what about art? The formal claim for an infinitely demanding ethics has to be worked out with some content. And this is perhaps where art comes in. I'm not in the business of telling artists what to do. I'd rather that they showed me what can be done. But on my view, art can be a privileged space or site for the performance of ethical action. Art can be a privileged site for the performance of ethical action. The enactment of an engaged ethical subjectivity. In relationship to my own activities, um, I've tried to do this a little bit about with through collaborating with certain artists who I respect and I, I like. And it's something that we've also done through this uh, semi-fictitious, semi-fictitious avant-garde organization called the International Necronautical Society, which I won't bore you with now, but it's hugely interesting. And uh, a good example, I did an artwork. Not that, that we'll come back to that, maybe. But this is a, oh, that's not that either. Those are all the diagrams together. Looks rather nice, doesn't it? All the diagrams together. This was a billboard that uh, I did with Liam Gillick in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. So it was a, a huge billboard that drivers, when they're walking, you know, they're driving along, they see a billboard. And it says drive safe, right? And it's got something written on here. And you flip it over, it says, Ah, must shed its empty defensive irony where every artwork can be reduced to a one-line gag on a billboard like this and recover its seriousness, commitment, and capacity for resistance. You get it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I could do two things here, and I'd rather put it to a democratic vote. Um, would you rather hear about humor in relationship to art, or would you rather I talked about politics? Politics? Sorry? Politics, okay. Do I have your general assent? All right, okay. All right, good, okay. Both? Oh my God. I can't do both. The idea is that basically that this would be a longer argument, but uh, it's a good argument, but it would take a while. Um, that if this, this is a mistake, it shouldn't be casting, it should be dusting. This is an ethical experience in relation to Lacan. That doesn't really have to concern us. The point I'm trying to emphasize in the diagram is that the, the ethical subject has a relationship to the ethical demand, which is what Lacan calls the real. 
doesn't matter what that is, right? Ethics is subjectivity's relationship to some demand. The aesthetic is the dimension, is the work of what a psychoanalyst called sublimation. Now, sublimation is important insofar as the, as um, in sublimation, the, the, the passion of ethics is transformed. Is transformed and um, can become something else. And um, the in philosophy, the things that interest me, for the most part, what tends to get emphasised as a model of the aesthetic is is tragedy. And uh, I want to place against that an account of humour. And let me try and explain this really, really simply. Um, and let me do it with an example of. Um, from uh, from Sigmund Freud. Um, Freud, in 1927, wrote a little essay called De Humor, Humor. In this little essay, he examines a joke. The joke is the following. A man is going to be executed. It's funny so far, right? A man is going to be executed. On the morning of his execution, he's led out from his cell to the courtyard, and he sees the, the gallows ahead of him, where he's going to be hanged. He looks up at the sky, and he says in German, Na, die Woche fängt gut an. Well, the week's beginning nicely. Right? Freud's thought is what is humorous in that joke? Where is the humor? His answer is that in humor, the condemned man who's going to be killed looks at himself from outside of himself and finds himself ridiculous. He looks at himself from outside of himself and finds himself ridiculous. The humor consists in the realistic um, affirmation of a state of affairs. But the effect of the joke, Freud says, is elevating and liberating. Elevating and liberating. So humor for me is a very important aesthetic practice. And one could link that to the use of humor in relationship to art, performance art, contemporary art. That doesn't mean that all art that uses humor is funny. On the contrary, a lot of it's really unfunny and bad. But it's, it's a potentially important practice. The humor of art can be a way in which that ethical demand can be both maintained and alleviated. That's humor. The, on politics, um, how long have I got now? 10, okay. Um, in relation to politics, 20, okay, great. Oh, that's good. That's more than enough. Um, I'm going to read a couple of pages. Politics is praxis in a situation that can articulate and indeed create a distance from the state that allows for the emergence of new political subjectivities which exert a universal ethical claim. That's my thesis. Politics is praxis in a situation that can create a distance, an interstitial distance from the state that allows for the emergence of new political subjectivities which exert an ethical claim. I see this proposition as consistent with the affirmation of anarchism, that most glorious of Russian inventions in the writings of Bakunin and Kropotkin. Right? Marxism was a Western European invention by bourgeois Germans like Karl Marx, 
the true Russian tradition, the true Slavic tradition is anarchism. We should never, remember, never forget that. Whereas Marxism can be seen as a theoretical discourse about revolutionary strategy based on a more or less eschatological theory of history, anarchism can be understood as an ethical discourse about revolutionary practice. So anarchism is a kind of ethical discourse, um, whereas within Marxism, one finds a hostility to ethics. Ethics is bourgeois deviation. Right? It's all about the class struggle and the socioeconomic. Anarchism emphasizes ethics as a binding factor in political practice. However, unlike classical anarchism, with its emphasis upon liberation, what we might call, what I call neo-anarchism is more organized around responsibility. Infinite responsibility that arises in relationship to a felt wrong, an experience of injustice. And it's in relationship to this neo-anarchism that I attempt to understand contemporary political struggles. So the one, as it were, change I make to the thought of anarchism is that anarchism is not um, necessarily consistent with libertarianism. It's not necessarily about freedom in some um, classical way. What I, what I call neo-anarchism is an anarchism that is more concerned with infinite responsibility in relationship to an experience of a moral wrong that one responds to. And although ethical and political concerns have been at the center of my thinking since I was a student, um, the ethical arguments that I've tried to sketch this morning began to take shape in relationship to the political radicalization that burst into media prominence with the famous Battle of Seattle in Seattle against the meeting of the WTO in late November 1999, and which spawned the so-called anti-globalization movement and later the anti-war movement. What suddenly seemed to be available, and which had, in truth, gestated for a much longer time in movements such as the Zapatistas, was a new language of civil disobedience, an often intensely comical language. This is where I would connect this with things like Pussy Riot. Often intensely comical language, anarchist in its tactics and aspirations, which conducted a wildly imaginative and successful non-violent warfare against the state apparatus. So what has been, I think, unleashed in relationship to contemporary phenomena of resistance is a new language of civil disobedience, which is a form of non-violent warfare. A truly democratic politics requires the articulation of at least two elements. Firstly, a demand, the infinite demand that flows from the felt perception of a wrong or an injustice. And secondly, there is a location, a terrain where that infinite demand is articulated. There is no politics without location. So making it, again, very, I try to make very simple arguments this morning because it's my, you know, it's what philosophy should do. It shouldn't complicate things, it should simplify things. Politics. I understand it is based in two concepts, concepts a concept of, of, of a demand, an infinite demand, and a concept of location. Infinite demand and location. Think about this in relationship to Occupy Wall Street. And again, I mention this because it's local and uh, for no other reason. I don't think it's a particularly privileged moment. Firstly, there was a visceral sense of a moral wrong. Namely, that corporate financial capitalism, particularly the banking system, had used federal government money in order to save itself at the expense of ordinary citizens. One of the key slogans of the autumn of 2011 was, banks got bailed out, we got sold out. 
So the experience was a, a, uh, an experience of a moral wrong. In relation to this wrong, this injustice, the Occupy Wall Street movement took shape not in relationship to the pragmatic demands of normal politics, but in relation to infinite demands. Demands which called into question the entire existence of the normal governmental political system and the capitalism that it fostered and served. Occupy Wall Street was persistently criticized by those in power, particularly in the broadcast media, uh, in the form of the following question. Who are your leaders and what do you want? Right? Who are your leaders and what do you want? But the strength of the movement, insofar as it lasted, consisted in the refusal to answer those questions, in the refusal to congeal around a leader in the manner of conventional politics, the Tsarist model, the Leninist model, the Putin model. The request for pragmatic finite demands was met with infinite demands, occupy everything, end income inequality, this is what democracy looks like. Occupy Wall Street formed a new political subjectivity around the slogan, we are the 99%. In relation to the massive disappointment that grew through the first years of the Obama administration, the Occupy movement created a political space where none previously existed. So the example here in relationship to my thought is that Occupy Wall Street would be the example of the creation of an interstice, the creation of an interstice, of a gap, a, a gap created through infinite demands. What took physical shape in Zuccotti Park from 2011 onwards was a location where radical demands were linked together with the occupation and redefinition of space. A small, inconsequential, privately owned park in Lower Manhattan became the material evidence of another form of life. One based not on private acquisitiveness, but on what Kropotkin would call mutual aid. Demonstration and protest of the kind that we see with such urgency in Kiev, or as you say, Kiev, today, are essential but transient phenomena. They're essential but transient phenomena, often doomed to abstraction. In order to avoid that fate, this would be a separate topic. I mean, if, if there is a, an ethics of the infinite demand that is articulated in situations of protest and resistance, um, what happens next? What is the relationship of such movements to normal politics, to the political, pro to the political process? If we remain with a politics of protest, then we can be accused of a politics of abstraction, a politics of beautiful abstraction. And I think that's something that has to be thought through, but that's a, both a theoretical and a practical question. The classical nation state, or indeed the supranational state, like the EU. I'm no particular fan of the EU. The EU is no longer a political terrain because sovereignty has been outsourced from the people to banks, credit rating agencies, and shadowy investors. If that's the case, then the political task is the creation of a terrain at a distance from the state to show that another form of life is not just possible, it can become actual. What erupted so gloriously in autumn 2011 under the name of Occupy and precursor movements like Los Indignados in Madrid was only the beginning. The genius of popular protest cannot be put back into the bottle. It is not the business of philosophers to engage in prophecy. But in relationship to the increasing disillusion with normal politics, I would foresee a time of continuing social dislocations which will have dramatic effects. Those effects will often, perhaps for the most part, be deeply reactionary 
xenophobic, nationalistic, but they will also possibly be radical and egalitarian. That's the nature of political conflict, it seems to me. Such movements, if they're radical and egalitarian, will probably always be violently and bloodily repressed, as we saw in Syria. But they cannot be eliminated. Right? I mean, the, 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 the truth of history is that history is written by the people with the guns and the sticks. Right? The people with the guns and the sticks usually decide things. The strange thing about history is that given that the people with the guns and the sticks usually beat human beings into submission, there can still be moments when that's not the case. When human beings, through the assertion of their powerlessness, their powerlessness acting in some kind of moral concert, acting together morally, can, through their powerlessness, effect some kind of transformation. It's always unlikely, it's always improbable, but it can happen. Beyond the grotesque spectacle of art, and art is a grotesque spectacle. I'm not an artist, so I can say that. Uh, the grotesque spectacle of art as commodification, art reduced to the pragmatic and stupid demands of the market and the rest. Um, artists are, I think, a vital element in the formation of this moral force, this powerless power. So despite everything, and again, the easiest thing to be cynical about is contemporary art. Right? It invites cynicism. Right? Despite that, there can still be uh, examples of artists who can, um, who can do something else. I mean, I mean, one strange thing that I remember <clears throat> um, is that uh, about the relation of ethics to aesthetics, let's say, is that shortly, shortly after the end of Occupy Wall Street, a friend of mine published a, a little kind of pop-up book, an instant book on the, um, on the events. And it began with a, with a ground plan. We began with a picture of Zuccotti Park, the rectangle, the rectangle and there was the, um, uh, the library here, the, the general assembly space, the, uh, the media space, the, the kitchen, uh, sleeping area, and so on and so forth. And looking at it, you think, fuck, it's an installation. It's an installation. Five minutes. It's an installation. <laughs> Meaning, and it's an installation, not just an installation, it's an installation which looks spookily like a Thomas Hershorn installation. It looks exactly like the, uh, the things that he was, he was engaged with, it, with his uh, various monuments. And those of you who had the chance to see those four monuments, there was the Bataille monument, the Deleuze monument, oh, what was the, f there was the, the Gramsci monument this summer that I'll talk about in a second, and the fourth one was Spinoza, Spinoza. And they were attempts, to, and again, it's very easy to be cynical, perhaps, say, about, about Thomas Hershorn's work, but what, what drives that conception of art, that conception of the monument, is the creation of a location that's based upon an idea of infinite responsibility. That's very clear. Now, I'm not saying, and Thomas wouldn't say that this is politics. No, it's not politics. It's something, this is art. And it's art in a very formal way. It observes all sorts of formal requirements. But it can, to some extent, provide a matrix or a grid through which new forms of political resistance can be articulated. So what I would offer to you in, 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 you know, as, as a parting thought would be that ethics, aesthetics, and politics are three, three, aspects of one unified process. And that one unified process is one that I think, or I hope, that philosophers, thinkers, and artists could be both engaged in 
in a productive and powerful way. And thank you very much for listening.